Leaving Antarctica? Those are not in Antarctica. <laughs> we'll visit Australia and see some of its iconic species, like the kangaroos and the wallabies and the koalas and the saltwater crocodiles. and the black flying foxes. Here we are in the Kimberley. The Kimberley region is the bush of the bush in, in Australia. It is an area of um, only 30,000 people in a, a space that's the size of California. It is truly beautiful, especially if you like geology. And it's a very barren, remote place that's very hard to get to unless you have a boat but it is stunning for the sandstone formations that you can see. And here's a bowerbird. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of a bowerbird before, but they're really amazing. They collect different pieces of rock and plastic and anything, but in a specific color, and they do it to attract a mate. Now we're visiting Montgomery Reef. Montgomery Reef is a huge reef that there are huge tidal changes in that area of the world. An entire reef comes out of the water every day. And so what you're seeing here will actually be underwater shortly, but that is the, all the water rushing off of the reef. And you have egrets coming in to feed off the invertebrates they find. And as we leave Australia, we'll head over to Indonesia. So, to Indonesia and Malaysia, to the land of pirates and dragons. Komodo dragons eat deer, and they are venomous. It is not the saliva. In the past, they thought it was there was something in the saliva that killed people. It's, they're actually venomous. Oh, so yeah, this is, this is, uh, hold on. That's the public toilet there, no, like, no joke. <laughs> so just be careful if you ever visit. <laughs> And now we're visiting Borneo. This is, Indonesia is an, is an amazing place. It's, a, it's an amazing country that is made up of 17,000 islands. And one of those amazing islands is Borneo. We'll go up river here to see the orangutan. And meet a woman named Dr. Bra Bruti Galdikas, who is the equivalent of Jane Goodall or Diane Fossey. She's been on the cover of National Geographic, and she's studied orangutans for over 40 years. It is her life work. She helps with orangutan. Um, in addition to the research, she has an orphanage where she helps out with orangutans that have been displaced or their parents have been killed due to the palm oil. And if you know anything about palm oil, and it was news to me when I had gone over there because I've never, we don't hear about palm oil and the issue that that causes over in North America. But that's one of those things that really, um, I think we need to start looking for responsible harvesting of palm oil if we're gonna continue to use it. It is, they, in order to get palm oil, they burn down a lot of the forests that these animals need to live. And oftentimes they'll kill the mother and then the, 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 the child, the, the baby orangutan will be sold as a pet and chained up in the backyard. And so she and her team help rescue them and they have to teach them. Orangutans stay with their mothers till they're at least six years old. And so they have to be taught how to climb. I mean, they're very playful and very fun. Looks like he's coming in to give me a KO here. 
but they are truly beautiful creatures, and they only exist in Borneo and Sumatra. And if we destroy their forests, they won't exist anymore. <laughs> and the proboscis monkeys, which you only need the profile to figure out what kind of monkey that is. And long-tailed macaques. And the agile gibbons, one of the most amazing animals I've ever seen swing through the trees. Here we have a silver leaf monkey and a flying lizard. These lizards, there's a lot of things in, in Borneo that you'd be amazed that can fly, including snakes. Now, do they actually fly? No, they glide. But still, this is pretty amazing. This one, in fact, had landed on somebody's head while we were watching a performance, so, which is why we, we have a picture of somebody holding it. And mud skippers. And mud skippers that aren't so lucky. <laughs> and here we have a waggler's, waggler's uh, pit viper. These boats approached our ship as we were getting ready to get off on Komodo, and they, w at first we couldn't figure out what they wanted, but when they got close, they had a, a basket of eggs. And in that basket were turtle eggs, and they wanted to sell us these eggs to eat. And when we told them to bugger off, uh, the guy just ate the egg right there, like in front of us, as if, you know. It's unfortunate. devil scorpion fish and the octopus can you see it master of disguise you see the eye oh where is it crown of thorns and a barrel sponge Raja Ampat, we've now entered Raja Ampat, which is one of the most amazing coral reef systems I've ever seen. From what I understand, it is the place where they think coral reefs have evolved from. The coral reef system here is able to handle higher fluctuations of temperature that would cause bleaching in many other reefs. And so they're studying it to figure out what it is that allows them to handle the fluctuations more. Giant clams. Amazing, right? Now we're moving on to Africa. The location of my first assignment I ever did for National Geographic Kids Books, where I photographed wildlife in Kenya and Tanzania along with the Galapagos. This is an acacia tree at sunrise. I like his mane. It looks like he's using hairspray or something. <laughs> now we're in Ngorogoro Crater. This is looking out, out in the outside to this giant volcano. And now looking down into it, those brown spots you see are actually wildlife. My wife's uncle who lived in Africa for 20 years, said that the wildebeest, it was his favorite animal, and he said that the wildebeest was his favorite animal because it was, it was, or the saying goes that it was, God made it from the leftover pieces of all the other animals. <laughs> and one of my favorite little birds, the lilac-breasted roller. It's the national bird of Kenya and Botswana. It's just a simply stunning, beautiful bird. And rhino rhinos, as you know, are highly endangered. And we were fortunate to see some in, in Nairobi National Park. I remember this day, this moment, very dis distinctly because I had in the back 
a former NFL pro bowler, his name was Sean Springs, who played for the Redskins. He was actually my assistant on this trip. And yeah, I know, it's weird, weird right? Uh, NFL pro bowler play, uh, as, is my assistant. Well, anyways, he had asked to come along. And, uh, and I met him and he was a good guy. And so he came along with me. But I remember we were, we were in the back of uh, the vehicle. He was in the back of the vehicle. I was actually shooting out of a sunroof. And the rhino came, kind of barreled down towards us because there was actually a, a baby rhinoceros with them. And I can remember hearing the sound of him rolling up the car window. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what are you, what, what is that going to do? <laughs> we were in like the equivalent of like a Suzuki sidekick, you know? <laughs> and now leaving Africa, we go to Ireland. We'll touch down briefly to see some puffins here on a place called Skellig Michael. Many of you have never been to Skellig Michael or possibly ever heard of it, but it is the location where they filmed the ending scene of the new Star Wars, where they come upon Luke's, Luke. It's a very beautiful part of Ireland. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Skellig Michael is home to a monastic settlement um, that was from the sixth century, and the neighboring island, Skellig Beog, Little Skellig, has a colony of 50,000 gannets, one of the largest gannet colonies in Europe. And now we'll come back to North America and we'll visit a very rare species. This is a Cremody bear, or what many of you know as a spirit bear. There are only about 400 of these in the entire world. This is in a place called Butedale, which was an old fishery, an old cannery town. I like the fact, it w when we photographed, or when we saw this bear, it was almost dark. It was, it was very hard to shoot. It was pouring rain and it was almost dark and to see this animal was just so magical and what I loved about this was that to me it looked almost post-apocalyptic and the fact that it was rooting around through all this, you know, something that had almost like a bygone era, almost as if the wildlife had outlasted us despite our best efforts. And then we saw it again in the next morning. This is Dawes Glacier, a place where we saw a swimming moose. <laughs> and the Arctic Tern. This is the large. This this bird flies longer than it has the longest journey every year, twenty-five thousand miles. It goes from the Arctic to the Antarctic. That little tiny bird. You complain about your commutes. <laughs> now we're back home. This is Skyline Drive and a friend of mine, Brian. So how do we continue to foster wonder in our lives? I think by it's allow allowing nature back into our lives and homes. I recently did a program with the Audubon Society where we got our house certified as a wildlife sanctuary. And in fact, anyone can do it. You don't even need to have acres of land. You could have just a condo. It's about creating spaces in our, in our areas that we've taken away from the wildlife. Because if we don't provide that, the rate at which we are colonizing, <laughs> for lack of a better word, um, their wildlife, the land, we are in trouble. The birds are in trouble. The mammals are in trouble. Everything is in trouble. Simple things like adding a bird feeder, a birdhouse, planting native plants, all of this helps. How else do we do it? We visit our parks. This is Calvert Cliff State Park. This is the best four, four or five dollars, I forget what it is, you can spend in Maryland. It is awesome. You get to dig for fossils. My wife asked me what I wanted to do for my birthday this year. I said, I want to go dig for fossils in Calvert Cliff. And so we built a little sifter and we went out and we found some shark's teeth. And this is about sharing wonder with children and with yourself. 
We need to be able to touch wildlife, to really fall in love with it. We need to provide habitat for, that's my daughter planting milkweed in our backyard. If many of you don't know, um, if you get a chance to watch Flight of the Monarch, that's a really beautiful film that was recently filmed. It's an IMAX film. But it talks about the plight of the monarch, and, and one of the things that we need to do is provide more habitat for it. And the amount of pesticides we use in our backyards and in agriculture is scary. So if you can create a habitat for butterflies and help the monarchs and help them, the populations, it would be tremendously helpful. How else do we foster wonder? Well, we visit an aquarium or a zoo, especially reputable ones and world-class organizations like the National Aquarium here in Baltimore. Zoos and aquariums inspire our children to care about nature. They allow them to make a connection with many animals they might never see in the wild. If we don't allow them to make that connection, they won't fight to save them. I did a story for Ranger Rick that I pitched them many years ago about what it would be like to be a diver in the National Aquarium. For me, I thought it was one of those things that kids might think is a cool job they might dream about. And it's an amazing place. I like this quote by Emma Maris, who said in a recent TED Talk, in order to solve some of the environmental challenges we face, we need smart, dedicated people who care about nature. And the only way we're going to raise up a generation of people who care about nature is by letting them touch nature. I think what the National Aquarium has done with the Living Seashore should be applauded. It is a wonderful exhibit, and I hear they've just won a recent award for it, so congratulations. One of the things we do on a pretty regular basis is go for adventure walks in our neighborhood. And just strapping on a nightlight and seeing what we can find as we walk around is truly magical. There's a recent article I just read in The Guardian that it was entitled, If Children Lose Contact with Nature, They Won't Fight for It. In the article, it said, where are, where are the marches, the occupations, the urgent demands for change? While the great majority would like to see the living pr planet protected, few are prepared to take action. This, I think, reflects a second environmental crisis, the removal of children from the natural world. The young people we might have expected to lead the defense of nature have less and less to do with it. They spend too much time indoors. And I don't think this applies just to children. We adults need to go out and connect with nature. We live very routine indoor lives. We need to get out and explore our local parks. Make a list and start knocking them off. We all live near countless neighborhood, city, county, state, and federal parks all that are within very close proximity to all of us. In fact, 71% of the people in the US live within a 10 minute walk of a city park. We need to get out and explore. Find a favorite one and go back, invite friends, and leave the phone at the home or in the car. Lastly, think about educating yourself about some of the challenges that the natural world is facing, both abroad and at home. The choices you make when you go to the grocery store, have far-reaching environmental consequences. The palm oil that I'm talking about is in things such as Oreos. Very common things. It's in margarine. It's in any number of consumer products, including candles. Become an educated consumer, because if we, if, if we consume less, or do, do we demand for verified, better, environmentally safe choices, the industry will follow. These are a few of the trips that I'll be on and expeditions that I'll be doing, including an upcoming one to Antarctica, South Georgia, and the Falkland Islands in two weeks. If you'd like to follow along, my Instagram is just my name. It's Jeff Moritzen. I post daily updates of um, as often as I can, not always daily, because we, we use a ship satellite. It's not always the best internet. Finally, I'll leave you with one last quote from Carl Sagan. We have an obligation to fight for life on Earth, not just for ourselves, but for all those humans and others who came before us and to whom we are beholden, and for all those who, if we are wise enough, will come after. 
This talk is dedicated to my daughter. Thank you. Well, that's truly inspiring. Thank you so much. It's beautiful. When did you know you wanted to be a photographer? I've, I've, since I was a kid, I've always enjoyed, um, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but I always had, you know, those kind of disposable cameras, and then I'd get antique cameras that were passed down to me. And uh, finally, when I was 16, I was old enough, I, I bought something off of what was called the paper shop in Pennsylvania. And I sp it was spent $100 that I'd saved up to get a, a Canon um, DSLR, and uh, it was the best money I ever spent. And, yeah. We do have, I'm going to pick up this other mic over here since we don't actually have to share. <laughs> but while we're doing that is somebody has a very good question because you made a lot of really good points about krill and palm oil. Is, has there been a specific photo shoot that led to a behavior change? Um, was that quote directed specifically to me or was it? I mean, there have been it many It was actually <laughs> not directed to me, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if personally if there's something that I specifically photographed that led to a behavior change. That is obviously the hope I think of anybody that that um, photographs wildlife and conservation. Um, but I know that there are, you know, one of the great projects right now is a is a friend of mine and fellow photographer Joel Sartori is doing his photo arc, and the work he's trying to do is is show people some of the last species on earth and get them to look them in the eye and and say these species are worth saving and um i know he's he's definitely been responsible for saving some some birds in particular i think there was one called the grasshopper sparrow in florida um, which he was able to save just because he got the fish u.s fish and wildlife to put it under the protect become protected so so someday, well, hopefully someday. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, your your photos are absolutely gorgeous, and you know, kind of on that line, you know, you're obviously a professional photographer. But how would we've had some folks ask, you know, for amateur photographers that want to get their photos out to help show a cause and to help show what changes are occurring? Is there a way to do that for amateurs as well? For sure, definitely. There's, um, in fact. You know, I mean, there's the National Geographic Your Shot community, which is constantly looking for photographs. Smithsonian um, has a program um, of citizen science. It's basically citizen science is what what you're doing. You'd be a, you'd be helping, you know, with a lot of programs where they need to document species or, you know, get counts on species. So for sure, there's there's lots of great programs. I can't name one specifically other than I know Smithsonian is a good place to start. And I agree. I mean, the citizen science point you mentioned is is it's critical because there's not enough there's not enough you know people working professionals working there's not enough scientists and so we need the citizen scientists and you've made some really great points about how it's easy to do observation and how it teaches kids and so what um, what was probably one of your most I mean you probably are asked this quite a bit but what's your favorite photo photograph that you've ever taken probably the moment my daughter was born yeah <laughs> It, I was very a nervous wreck, and uh, for me, it was, I was if I could con if I could get my brain around, you know, getting the right angle and the right lens and all that. But it was the moment she came out. I think it was was my favorite personal photograph. Um, I don't know if I have a specific other one. I'd love to, f you know, I mean, Antarctica recently has been kind of amused. It's so beautiful. Ah, uh, it's just so. uh, it is gorgeous. I had the fortune of being there at one point, and it is it is majestic. Your photos were. Gorgeous, but it sounds like, and I can imagine, you know, with well, clearly with your daughter, that would be the favorite. And it sounds like it was maybe a stressful experience for you, not to mention your poor wife. But but you, <laughs> getting the photo lens just right, <laughs> must have been. <laughs> it was. In fact, I was so nervous that day that I had, I had put the, you know, they give you these caps that you put on your shoes when you walk in there to keep them, you know, clean, the sterile environment. And I put it on my head. I thought it was the thing you wore on your. <laughs> Head and they had given me these extra large pants, and I, I, you can clearly see I'm not an extra large guy. And so as I was walking down the corridor, they fell down, and so it was just, and I had to be told by the nurse, not even I couldn't even realize that I my pants were around my ankles. I, you know, so I was an absolute nervous wreck. And I was really just joking. <laughs> no, it's a big deal. Yeah. Yes, yes, it was. 
course, of course. So that is, and here we have even more for you. But, you know, here's one of the questions for you is, now this is actually getting maybe a little bit more uh, technical, but do you prefer digital or film? That's a great question. Digital, without a doubt. I learned film. Um, I grew up, obviously, through the film era, and I graduated from Penn State, and I'm actually self-taught. I, um, I only took two courses in school. I took a history of photography and a black and white film class. And at that time, digital photography was out of the realm of uh, somebody who was going to college. It was like $10,000 for like a two megapixel camera, I think. So <laughs> yeah, I learned film, and but I don't miss it. I, I'm not one of those artists that pines for the film days, the good old film days. I, I like digital. I like the fact that I can see what I've shot. I like the fact that I can, you know, um, edit it right away. I like the fact that, I don't know. It's just, it's a wonderful medium. Yeah, no, and and um, again, being just somebody very amateur, my only problem is is that I like the film because you then have to force to go print it out. Yes. That's because I'm a Luddite, right? All right, right. so we'll, no. just, we'll just move but on. But you're right, but though, and you touched upon an important thing, is the fact that we don't print enough stuff nowadays. Everything is digital, and we don't, nobody prints. It's a real tragedy because there's just so many amazing yeah. pictures that we take that we never print. We never see them anymore, and yeah, I mean... You're right. Well, well, uh, yeah, and just thinking about how you catalog all of this, and I mean, is there a... So yeah, so with digital becomes, you have this huge amount yeah. of images, and I have a backlog of like 30,000 images that I still need to go through and edit and keyword and all that. And um, yeah, it's just a matter of staying on top of it and using programs, like I use Adobe Lightroom, which I think is a great program for editing and organizing, so. Excellent, and, and of course, most of us want to know as well is how, if you know, if there are people in the audience or particularly young people in the audience or old people like me, how would you get a job at National Geographic as a photographer? What no, would be man. there? What's the route for that? I don't think asked. there's one quick route. So um, there aren't, there, I think there are only two maybe staff photographers at National Geographic. So I don't, I'm not an employee of National Geographic. I happen to do some freelance assignments for them. Um, and I think everyone's path is different. And I think it's a very challenging path to get to do work for them. Um, but I think it's a matter of pushing yourself and going to portfolio reviews and getting your images. Um, you know, going asking somebody other than your mom to look at your images, right? Because your mom's going to tell you they're great. But if you go and ask, you know, an editor, they're probably going to tell you that you need to work on something, which is really important. So, um, yeah, you have to constantly strive and look and r see what other people are doing and figure out how to do it better. Right. So. Right. And then network. I mean, how I met, how I got my job was I was, I sat on the board for a, an association called the American Society of Picture Professionals, which were photo editors and photographers. And on that board were people from Discovery, from Getty, from National Geographic. And I've since done work for, for Discovery and National Geographic. And, and I knew that you, that's how you, you've got to, you know, you have to make a personal connection. The world today is not just digital. You have to have that personal connection. Right, right. That is so true. So true. And, and it's, um, well, that's true with everything. <laughs> <laughs> but with, uh, you know, another aspect with National Geographic is when you are on expedition with them, and if you should see, you know, a situation, animals or plants or ecology or any type of environmental issue, do you, have you personally stepped in? Have you, does National Geographic, somebody wants to know, do they step in or... How are, you know, so it's going beyond just using your photos, but actually at the time. Actually stopping something from happening? Is that what yeah, you're saying? It could or be, or if you're seeing something in distress, an animal in distress, or you're seeing um, something that a government needs to take care of. Mm -hmm. I, you know, so it's, I think people just kind of want to know how can, how have you helped, have people helped on expeditions? That's a really great great question, and I'm not sure I have the answer for that. But I know that it, oftentimes, as you've probably seen in the news recently, there has been people that have helped out with eagles that are drowning mm -hmm. um, or en ensnared in, in fishing line. And they've, and it, I think that very much comes down to it's a personal decision right. to do that. Um, so I, don't, I can't personally say that I know of an incidence. Yeah. You know. Well, and you're a photographer, you know, and then you're, there's sort of a distance as well. Right. I mean, you're the photographer. Right. There's you're an abstract. You're capturing it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting, um, but with the, when you were talking before about um, sort of how to move into this field, this is also clearly a way for kids and everybody, young generations coming up, to connect to nature. Yes. And to be, you know, doing sort of wildlife viewing, wildlife recreation viewing. Are you seeing sort of the industry of photographers with the changes to digital, with the changes to cell phones and everything else? Are we still seeing, you know, this field continuing to move forward? I mean, obviously there's photographers, but I'm talking about for young people getting into the field. Um, young in what sense? Like kids or are you talking kids. like... Kids. Yeah, yeah. not you. Yeah. Kids. Yeah. I think no. Kids. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just curious because there are a lot of, you know, there are people that are interested in, like you said, becoming professional wildlife well, photographers just, or yeah, just I'm thinking kids. More like, yeah, like, you know, is it, is it a way to engage kids? I think without nature? a doubt. Yeah. My daughter um, loves photography. Santa got her a camera this year and, and she loves going with me on hikes. And I think what we need to do is get kids out into nature because it's amazing. But many kids are scared of nature or they don't want to go outside. They're afraid of bugs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much magic out there. And if we don't introduce them to it, they're not going to save it. They're not going to want to protect it. It is something that's going to need to be contained and, you know, uh, you know, or developed. Right, right. No, and it, it absolutely is. And you made a really good point that if people are not connected to nature, the next generation that grows up, they're going to be our leaders. 10 to 20 years, and if they haven't been connected to nature, they're not going to vote for those. They're not going to allocate budgets. I mean, you're, right. you're exactly right. Plus their own physical, spiritual, mental health. Yep, it's all of it. But when you are, getting back to sort of the photography, when you are taking pictures in nature, how do you manage to stay in the moment of taking, you know? I'm always in the, for me, I find that looking through the lens is like hyper-reality. It's like you, you went from standard TV to HDR. Like I'm hyper-vigilant. I'm hyper-aware of everything that is happening. Um, so I don't find that it ruins the moment for me. I find that it enhances the moment for me. Hmm. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question right. But <laughs> and are you using the 360? No, I saw that Nikon just came out with... Um, well, I meant actually the... Uh, what's the... Uh, the the you can put on the glasses yes and the, the virtual the reality the virtual reality yeah that that's really cool and i think it's something i don't think it's going to be like the 3d tvs like that everyone says is really going to come and then it doesn't um i think <laughs> vr really will come especially because they've got platforms like the playstation and the you know that are in people's houses that are going to be able to use that technology so i think that's a really interesting um realm of photography that will definitely be explored. In fact, Nikon just came out with um, a new camera. It's a, it's a line of cameras that take 360 degree video and photos. Um, and so it's really amazing to think about the implications of that. And just the fact that you could, you know, actually film, you know, walk around and look through a video as it's being recorded and just look around as if you were there on yeah. that. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it clearly is another form of connection, and it's just a matter of, you know, how far down the spectrum do you go? Is Do you still get the same connection right. versus the experience? And, um, I mean, I think it's probably all degrees, and as long as you're seeing the nature and getting some sort of perspective, it's all good. But it is an interesting... It is, for sure. Interesting, dis interesting debate about that, I think, uh, moving forward. But... Um, how is, now here's, a, here's somebody that threw you, and she's actually a seventh grader. Uh -oh. And she threw you a, a, nice, a nice softball oh, question. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> she said, what is the best way to get the word out about your photography? Oh, wow. wow. Holy cow. <laughs> I really? I so, did not. <laughs> so, Jeff. <laughs> well, <laughs> Ava. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that question. Um, I have a website. It's just my name. It's jeffmoritzen.com. And I have an Instagram. It's probably where I spent share most of my work is on Instagram, and which is just instagram.com forward slash jeffmoritzen. And on there I is where I post my the travels. And when I'm home, I post photos from home. And sometimes I'll post archival stuff. Um, but it's really kind of uh, my way to connect with the world and share it, share you know a bit of the journey as well. Oh, and it's so appreciated. I mean, this was so powerful and so beautiful. 
And it Thank really you. was just, um, it was inspiring. I mean, it, it does its job. It is so inspiring. Well, thank you. I, this is, um, I generally give photography talks on how to take photos and not as much on conservation and uh, encouraging, you know, practices, better, you know, practices. And I, it's something I need to do more of. And so it was one of those, it, it, especially for my daughter and, and the future generation, I think, um, it's really important that we all make smarter decisions. And so I really appreciate you allowing me to come and talk and asking me, and, you know. So oh, thank you. Uh, well you are always welcome back. I mean, this was incredible. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you. And we will be having our final MLB lecture for this year on December 13th with Mark Tursak from the Nature Conservancy. So thanks to everyone for coming and safe travels home. <laughs>